about uh, the elixir of uh, longevity. So, an applause, please, for uh, Dr. Mario. Okay, nice to see you all. Uh, I'm going to say a few things that are probably uh, completely the contrary of what you heard until today. Because um, my view is that when we talk about aging and the cure for aging, um, the cure would, would not be something physical. It would not be a pill, an injection, or a therapy. But we'll see. So, uh, we start with the definition of aging in a clinical sense. Aging is a uh, time-related dysfunction. If you see that um, with the passage of time, there is accumulation of damage which causes dysfunction. And this is the main problem, the dysfunction, not a disease. We may have a disease, but still be able to live our life normally. If we are not able to live our life because of uh, damage due to aging, then this is, the, this is the problem. I agree that we will be able to find therapies for individual diseases, but when we talk about treatment for the basic biological process of aging, then this will not happen uh, through therapies or uh, individual uh, treatments that many of us um, have in mind today. Um, we think about treatment as, do as doctors. In other words, there is a healer who gives uh, a treatment to a, to a patient, and that treatment is something that you give. It could be... Um, uh, in the old times, they used to talk about the fountain of youth, in other words, water, or special treatments through um, uh, secret mystic things, or a pill, um, a tablet, an injection, Nowadays, we talk about more complicated treatments, but they are still physical treatments. It's something we do to a patient. You can see here rejuvenation biotechnologies, stem cells, some drugs, and so on. They are still treatments. Um, and I am saying that these are not going to be effective in, in eliminating aging. So we need to talk, we need to start thinking about something more, more abstract, not necessarily as something we can touch or see. Um, these treatments can eliminate some, eliminate some diseases which are related to aging, but they are not eliminating the process of aging as such. And that's why we are not able to find a treatment. We've seen before uh, all these efforts of people trying to find treatments against aging and um, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, we still don't have any treatments that people can take and, and stay young. So we, and I think we'll never have such a treatment. And the reason is that we can talk about it biologically but when it comes to using it in society, in real people, then we have all sorts of problems because um, uh, I'll explain some of the reasons in a minute. But that, does, that is not all bad news. I think aging will be eliminated. In other words, we are going to be able to live without aging until, until we die from something else. So we can live without chronic uh, degenerative diseases, uh, but we may die from an infection or from an accident or uh, any other cause of aging, apart, uh, any other cause of death apart from aging. This will happen uh, whether we like it or not, because that's how human evolution is, that's how uh, society progresses. We'll see some of the details. So the first thing that we got wrong is that uh, the human body is a machine. 
and uh, if something breaks in, a, in a, the human body, it's the equivalent of something breaking in a car and we change it and uh, we have good health. That's wrong, that's a very simplistic way of seeing the human body. The human body is not a machine. Um, I'll mention a few examples in a minute. And then, even if we do come up with um, treatments, these will not be usable by the general public. Maybe a few people can use them, but not the general public in general. So, we see here just a small example of what happens uh, in biology of uh, signaling, um, uh, signaling pathways. We tend to think as in a mechanical way, in other words, we give um, we give us the, the drug, and this can affect the receptors, and the receptors can have an output. But it's not in reality. The human body is not like that. It's, uh, it's much, much more complicated than this. Um, just a single, a single receptor may have up to two billion different configurations. Imagine that. 2 billion configurations. So it's not just one, one configuration of a receptor and we give the right drug and this responds in the way we want it. Uh, it's more like a cloud, like a, a, an ill-defined configuration. So, uh, as I said, we'll see some clinical because we are not interested in developing therapies in the laboratory. We are interested in developing therapies that can be used by people and get better. That's the main aim. Whether we have 10 mice who got better or 10 fruit flies that uh, got worse, we don't care. I don't care. I'm a clinical uh, doctor and I care about people, patients. So that's one obstacle of applying um, the research in the laboratory of translating it into patients, real patients. And one thing that comes to mind is that the, the duration of the treatment. We say we'll have these therapies and give it to people. Yes, but how long are we going to give them for? Just once? Every week? Every year? Um, this is one small example of uh, giving stem cell therapies. Uh, it's not just a matter of giving an injection and the patient goes home. Um, you have to do a, a bone marrow transplant, you have to have protocols, you have to have clinics to deliver the treatment. The patient has to stay in for a few, a few weeks, um, have uh, other treatment to maximize the therapy and so on and so on. I mentioned many details here. But then it continues. They have to go back for follow-up. They have to have the right clinic, the right doctors. The doctors have to have their pain appointments. And uh, we, there comes a point that the health systems of uh, the countries are not going to cope. It's one thing to say we have this injection for stem cells, but <coughs> we cannot give it to the general public because there are so many uh, obstacles, clinical and administrative. <coughs> and then, uh, would people take this treatment? I think the many, uh, a large percentage will not take it because, as an example, we see the treatment for um, anti-retroviral uh, medication for AIDS, 37% of people just don't, don't take it. So it's a life-saving medication, they don't take it. So what makes us think that if we have treatments for aging, people will take them. Maybe we won't take them. And then it's a matter of side effects, uh, duration of treatment, appointments, as I mentioned, <coughs> complexity and so on. If we take all of these things together, we see that um, we are not going to get anywhere. So we are going to have a life of 
just going to the hospitals, going to the clinics every day, having treatments, having tablets, having uh, injections, and our life would be just a, a nightmare of going from one hospital to another. I don't know if uh, anybody can counteract this argument, but if you think about it, that's how it would be. Um, so, I'm suggesting to live, okay, work, if you want to work on these uh, therapies, yes, and then um, start thinking about an abstract way of defining aging. And um, I think this abstract way is coming on its own through a modern evolution of society. So, technology is increasing, we are becoming humans who are embedded in a technological environment. This environment stimulates our brain. Um, and makes our brain and our place in this society more complex. So if we have information from a digital environment which comes constantly to our brain, that means our neurons are getting uh, stimulated in a positive way. And uh, this is a hypothesis I developed saying that um, this stimulation of the brain through technology, constant technology, all around us, um, this will um, cause biological changes in the body, in the brain mainly. It will stimulate the neuronal stress response. So if we put our brain under positive stress, not negative, not too much, some, some stress to activate our mechanisms, this will create substances. I mentioned a few examples here which um, attract repair resources to make the neuron live longer. So when the neurons of our brain live longer, it means that we live longer as well. And uh, that's something that will happen because that's where our society goes. It's not, love, it's not uh, something that we have a choice on. It will happen necessarily. So, as a first part, I'm arguing that uh, physical treatments will not eliminate the process of aging. And as a second part, I'm suggesting that if we engage with technology, um, get involved with upgrading our brain with information that requires to act, then this will have a positive effect on, on all humanity and uh, we'll start seeing signs that we live longer at the expense of having children. So that's one uh, answer to the overpopulation things. The longer we live, the less children we have. And I will leave it at that. Well, thank you very much. We have time for one question before we have uh, over the grade. Does anyone want to make a quick question, please? Yeah, is there a mechanism here? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess I'm a student. I was thinking about the technical hurdles to what, to what is possible, but you did not present a, like a mechanistic reason for why it's not possible. You also presented um, a prediction about something that is going to happen, mm -hmm. but you didn't present how it was going to happen. You just uh, stated that it's clear. Yeah, I, I can come present it if you want, but it takes an hour on each question. Well, I mean, the presentation was so, did you spend less time about what technically said that? I would love to hear from yeah. you. If you have time to go into the website mentioned here, it mentions all the technical details that you want and many more, and uh, all the technical obstacles as well. But basically, it's based on common sense. You can no, see. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah? <laughs> okay.